Thank you so much for the introduction um, and thanks to um, Dr. Ramana and all of the organizing committee um, for the invitation to be part of this, um, this uh, really incredible um, conference. So I will take, uh, I'm honored to be able to introduce the first speaker who is a good friend um, here in the United States. Um, probably doesn't need much introduction, but uh, Igor Beliansky from Annapolis, Maryland is going to be speaking on um, a bird's eye view. Is there any role for minimally invasive uh, repairs? So Igor, go ahead and take it away. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the honor of invitation. Uh, the title of my talk today is Loss of Domain. Is there any role for MIS repair? Uh, my name is Igor Bilansky. I am a director of Dunwater Construction uh, Center here in Annapolis, Maryland, United States. Here are my disclosures. So again, I was uh, asked to talk about loss of domain. And uh, first of all, uh, this is not your typical hernia. When you repair uh, the loss of domain cases, you change the physiology of the patient and uh, they can have fairly significant consequences for the patient um, if they are not ready to undergo the procedure. So the first thing you need to consider when you see a loss of domain patient uh, is not whether to book the patient or uh, you actually should look for a reason why you should not operate them. So again, stop and consider the consequences of your potential intervention and get the patient ready for the surgery. The, uh, again, without mind, the prior considerations that you should have is uh, first of all, how to reduce everything back. Uh, you should consider abdominal compliance. Every patient has different compliance. I think uh, we don't spend enough time talking about this, but one couple of ways to uh, change the compliance nowadays is the utilization of component separation as well as addition of uh, Botox, which uh, helps paralyze the muscles as well as helping the muscle stretch out by addition of progressive pneumoperitone. With those specific procedures, again, uh, you change the physiology, there is a significant risk of DVT. Uh, consider all the, also weight loss uh, before the surgery because the weight loss overall is also going to decrease the amount of adipose tissue inside the abdominal cavity, thus creating more room to reduce things back inside. Uh, you know, some people will talk about visceral reduction. What that means is actually excising portion of the viscera uh, to create more room. Again, I think that is really uh, kind of uh, in patients with truly end-stage hernia disease. And once you start considering that option, that really does increase your risks of complications. Uh, and it's a really fairly major procedure. And uh, as those of you who have done those cases uh, will know that there's very little room for error. Um, and then uh, also uh, kind of to help you make the decisions, imaging does play an important role in uh, our practice. We use CT scans to evaluate uh, the uh, incarcerated contents as well as to evaluate the abdominal domain. Case selection that I'll talk about here, you'll see, again, it's, this is not for all loss of domain cases. You'll see that I'm specifically talking about the cases that would benefit from what's uh, called a hybrid approach where I do part or all of the work uh, through MIS, minimally invasive approach, um, as well as, uh, but there's some portion of the case will, uh, that do need to be done, uh, performed through an open uh, access, the old fashioned way, like excision of extra skin, reduction of the concept that still may need to, need to be performed through an open approach. And you'll see in this particular presentation, the patients that I select for this approach, uh, while they do have loss of the main, their defects are not large. And they, a lot of times they'll have off of the midline defects, not directly through the center. So here's the first uh, case. And the first presentation is for giant loss for hernias. You'll see I combined two cases for this presentation, but uh, both of the cases are very similar. Uh, both of them had right a giant inguinal hernia, and this is a CT scan of the first patient who previously had a midline laparotomy for trauma surgery, as well as a very large and direct inguinal hernia that goes below his kneecap. You can see majority of the abdominal contents are in this hernia sac. Uh, and uh, in order to prepare this patient, we had the patient lose 20 pounds before the surgery. Five weeks prior to major surgery, we did Botox injection and IVC filter. And uh, 
for the Bodax injection, what we end up doing is we inject 100 units per site at three different spots, just interior to mid axial line. And what we do is at those three points, we inject uh, at the external oblique level, internal oblique level, and transverse subdamus muscle level at uh, the three different points. And we spread about 100 units of Botox per site. Um, this, is done, uh, uh, this is done four weeks prior to any intervention. After we uh, perform uh, the Botox injection, we'll wait four weeks because to, for the Botox to take effect, and then we'll place a peritoneal dialysis catheter. We'll place a peritoneal dialysis catheter and then admit the patient to the hospital um, and actually uh, perform progressive new peritoneum inflation of the belly. And uh, prior to the day of surgery, we obtain a CT scan. This is the CT scan that you see here. And this is a CT scan that tells us whether we're going to be able to proceed with surgical intervention or we, whether we're going to cancel the case. Because the last thing you want to be doing is uh, going through a case that you cannot reduce things back safely. So you'll see the CT scan here was a lot of air in the abdominal cavity, but you can also will appreciate significantly uh, more room that has been created intra-abdominally after Botox injection and progressive new heme combination to reduce things back inside. <clears throat> this is now uh, the day of surgery. And this gentleman had a previous midline. He has a peritoneal dialysis catheter right here. This is gonna be the first port. I'm gonna develop the retro rectus space here. On the rectal vision, I'm gonna place port two and port three. Again, he had a previous incision here. This is a relative contraindication for a corneal crossover. A week ago, when I placed a peritoneal dialysis catheter, I actually took any of the adhesions down. But, uh, before crossing over, in fact, in this case, I'm going to place port four, develop the right retroactive space. Then I'm going to cross over, <laughs> cross over and connect the spaces together. This guy also has a left hernia. Uh, so before addressing the right side, I'm going to place ports five and six, since, and I'm going to address the left side. I'm going to do a transverse abdominal, so limit it. When I say transverse abdominal, because all I'm going to do is essentially, this is why I present the arcade line. I'm going to just divide uh, the oh, arcade line and do bottoms up to arch, just up to here, to develop a large space right here. I'm obviously not going to be able to reduce this hernia. We're going to make a hockey stick incision. I'm going to use everything back. I'm then going to be able to place my meshes, and then the plastic surgeon is going to come in and uh, do this for the plastic. All right, stop. So now we gain access to uh, the uh, left retroactive space. This is done with uh, BIOS first entry port and direct vision. We're going to place a second port, and the section is going to be taken all the way down to the space of red seas through the left retroactive space. After placing an additional port, we're then going to pay attention to the medial aspect of left posterior rectus sheet as it contributes to the linear alba. And the contributions to the linear alba are going to be divided just. Uh, just a little bit lateral to linear alba. Um, and this way, as we divide the posterior sheet, we enter this pre peritoneal space superficial to the fossil ligament. So this is our crossover. The four three is uh, placed uh, next again. It's, uh, uh, and then uh, in this case, we developed the right retractor space already. And this is a true crossover, whereas there was a hook cautery. We're dividing now the right posterior sheet. You can see the peritoneal dialysis catheter in the field that's going to be pulled out. And so now we create this uh, space of uh, um, a space and retroactive space of connecting the left and right retroactive space together. We then are going to uh, divide, uh, as, as described earlier, the posterior male and thromblic and transversus abdominus aponeurosis and create the space superficial to transversal fascia. And the goal here, again, is to be able to, first of all, get a little bit of extra release uh, to be able to reduce the contents back together without much tension and also uh, to be able. Uh, to dissect around the actual neck of the hernia sac, but understanding that I'm not going to be able to reduce this all back laparoscopically. But uh, because the defect itself is not very large, it's actually very difficult to work through this. So not, this saves me making an extra incision. But uh, here I am. Now the retromuscular dissection is completely performed before the sac is reduced back. The next part is the open reduction of the contents. So again, at this point, what I have done is completely create a very large retromuscular space. I also repaired the left hernia. And so now is the actual reduction where the sac is open. Here. They come over here, bud? And everything is reduced back intra-abdominally. 
And all I'll have to do afterwards is inside the neck of the hernia sac, and I am in this retromuscular space that I have created for mesh right, relationship. Just to show. We'll, we'll get some more. We can take some pictures now. This is opening of the sac. So we're entering the sac now. Open this up and we'll take a look inside to see what it looks like. All his intestines right here. Down right here. All right, well, that's good. So show me uh well, I'm, I'm, I have a camera on so can you show me the test control? Uh, okay, then, like, so the defect uh, uh, the contents of the hernia were completely reduced back and dropped down. Lee. At that point, uh, we have a urologist actually looking at the testicle. Of course, an argument can be made that the testicle does not need to be preserved, but in this particular case, we were able to get Doppler signals and there were good flow of venous and arterial flow here. Uh, a little of a hydrocele here that our urologist is gonna fix. And we actually preserved the testicle in this case. Uh, again, everything is back inside. So now the only thing we have to do is place the mesh in this retromuscular space. Uh, but before doing this, the urologist is finishing their part. Now this is a look inside. You can see very large macrophores polypropylene mesh overlapping the whole space and also in the right uh, uh, my PT orifice is completely overlapped with a 3D max uh, mesh. The defect itself was closed from outside from the open reduction incision. And then everything kind of gets closed down and the, uh, the, uh, the air gets uh, desufflated uh, and uh, this is what it looks like inside. Now we just have to close the hockey stick incision and place the testicle back into the right hemiscrotum. fairly dramatic difference. You can see how the belly kind of uh, now is more pro, uh, rounder now that you reduce back the contents where it before it used to be flat. This is another case, very similar thing. Uh, this case was not all, that. this was a mostly in his intestine, but they went up to his knee. His actual sac went down to the ankle, but a lot of this was a filled with fluid, acidic fluid, which was all uh, suctioned out. And this is what the gentleman looks like. Uh, a few months after the surgery, be exactly the same procedure. And you can see again, very protuberant belly after everything is reduced back. So again, understand that the physiology of the patients is uh, changed after you reduce everything back. So you have to get them ready. So the, the several months work that we had to do before really paid off here because uh, all those patients were, to, most of those patients were able to discharge within four days after the surgery. Another case here, very similar in nature. This is a right low quadrant defect of uh, somebody with history of uh, open appendectomy that then was followed by a laparoscopic eye palm repair, which recurred uh, fairly quickly. And then this gentleman let this thing go. Uh, and when he presented to me, he had majority of his abdominal contents through this kind of uh, flank uh, lateral defect, uh, just, uh, just lateral to linear semilinaris on his right side. This is a CT scan. Again, I appreciate that majority of his abdominal contents outside. Again, the defect is not large. Uh, the midline is still preserved. So again, this is a good candidate for this type of hybrid approach that we just showed you for the inguinal hernias. In similar fashion, I uh, had this gentleman uh, lose some weight did Botox, did progress in new protonym, exactly identical uh, to how the previous two cases were just described. And in this case, uh, we uh, proceed to do the surgery robotically. Uh, and again, 
Um, but before doing that, uh, this is a CT scan. You want to make sure there's plenty of room to reduce the contents back and drop down lead. And uh, uh, the CT scan that was done a day before the surgery indicates that there's plenty of room to reduce things back inside uh, without, uh, uh, and the patient would be able to tolerate this procedure. See, as uh, uh, we scroll back, uh, plenty of room for intra-abdominal contents to uh, be placed back inside. One of the things that I mentioned, I place IBC filters in all those patients as they are at higher chances of thromboembolic events uh, as consequence of these procedures. Uh, either basket approach in this case, but now robotically, this is three ports into left retroactive space. Uh, in similar fashion, the medial contributions of the left posterior sheet are divided, entering the space superficial to the phosphor ligament. Everything gets placed back down. Those of you familiar with ETAP axis dissection, this should be very kind of familiar view to you. Uh, this is the crossover, the contralateral retrorectal space, kind of the spaces connected together. Again, the goal is to create this large space uh, to overlap. So there's a couple of things that, first of all, we're creating the space for the mesh and also doing a releasing incision to, again, help us reduce the contents back intra-abdominally and, uh, uh, again, to allow the patient to tolerate uh, this, uh, uh, this reduction uh, in post-operative period without significant change to uh, his or her physiology. Transversal abdominal release is performed to get just lateral to uh, linear seminal nares, uh, again, to fully overlap this lateral defect that just lateral to linear seminal nares on the right side. And you'll see that as we dissect superficial to transversalis fascia and peeling away the muscles from transversalis fascia, we're essentially going to encircle uh, the, um, the hernia sac. Again, we're not trying to reduce things back and drop downly, but if we were to reduce the contents back before performing this portion, then this portion, we would, there would be no room to work in here. Uh, so again, these steps are making it actually easier for me to perform this type of dissection before the actual reduction is done. So I'm doing this not because uh, it's fancy, I just think this actually makes the procedure easier to perform. This is the right MyPT orifice, the core structures are right here. And right here, you'll see as uh, we move up, you'll see the hernia sac, the neck of a hernia sac that we're gonna address in a second. This is an old mesh here. Again, we're completely encircled around the neck of a hernia sac. So the next step, is the open viscera, open the reduction of the contents. So now opening the sac. And in this particular case, uh, the patient had fairly significant interloop adhesions. So it took uh, some time to perform open adhesiolysis followed by the reduction of contents. Uh, this is my resident intern who is uh, uh, reducing things back inside. This case is actually from about uh, uh, four years ago. You can see how easily things reduce back. And the next step is all I have to do is incise the neck of a hernia sac from inside. And now I'm in the retromuscular space that I initially developed. The posterior layer gets closed. Mesh gets placed, the anterior layer gets closed, and then I can laparoscopically or robotically completely assure that the mesh is sitting nicely uh, in the flat position uh, under direct vision. There's no guessing. And I think it's very important to assure that the mesh is nice and flat for, to provide adequate integration between the muscle layers. Again, the mesh goes to surface all the way down and it provides posterior coverage of the microtene orifice here as well. This is a before picture, and we took a lot of the skin off. Uh, and what you can see small incisions, and everything was reduced back. And uh, this is what he looks like eight months later. And this, again, it was a few years ago. And this gentleman is doing quite well in long term follow up. So, again, uh, what I've talked about is MIS approach to loss of domain. This is done in selective cases. I want to emphasize this. Whenever you see loss of domain, whether you do it MIS or uh, open, uh, please do not rush to operate. The most important thing is setting yourself up for success and preparing the patient by losing weight, addressing their comorbidities, 
use Botox, uh, use uh, a progressive new input name, understand the consequences of using progressive new input name and risks associated with that. You know, when appropriate, consider the multidisciplinary approach in a big, uh, in big, in those big cases with excess skin, I think it's very uh, prudent to involve plastic surgeons. I also think that urology and then big English colophonies that go down below the knee are also uh, should be involved, especially if you need to catheter placement. Uh, those can be quite challenging to perform. Um, that's with that in mind. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I wish everyone the best of luck in India. I wish I could be there in person. Uh, but uh, hopefully, hopefully, maybe soon that we'll be able to get uh, over this COVID-19 pandemic. Have a good one. Best of luck. Do we have uh, Professor Flavio for a quick comment here? Yes. Hello, everyone. Thanks for the Hello, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity. It's hard to make any comments after uh, Igor's presentations. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll try to make some few quick ones. Is is I think the number one message from his lecture is stop and think about it. Think if you are the right surgeon for that procedure. Think that if that patient is the right uh, fit for you. If your institution has the resources. No matter how bad the situation is, we can always make it worse. So first, take a deep breath, judge your limits, judge your resources, and then move forward. Uh, I, I feel that hybrid procedures are something that we don't use so often, but it's really interesting to see how MIS surgeons, and I think I am MIS surgeons, we feel much more comfortable to see and open a mesh on a space on we do a scope than just open surgery. I'm pretty sure that's few, uh, a great number of open surgeries that will do the same cases that Igor presented just by open surgery. And that's okay if they really feel comfortable with that approach. I think that he brought something different, um, some, some hybrid approach to the same problems. I like that very much. I have a, a question for Igor that I struggle myself. Those patients, they did not have midline problems, the inguinal hernia and the right lower quadrant hernias, the midline of those patients uh, was intact. How do you feel about transect the posterior rectal sheet on an intact linear alba to get your, uh, uh, on the second case, the overlap and the first case, just expand the cavity? And would you consider plicating that normal linear alba uh, before a mesh or just transect the posterior rectal sheet bilaterally and just spread the mesh open? Though, that will be my, my only question. Uh, sure, uh, Flavio, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, uh, again, very, very kind words. Uh, to answer your question, in those particular cases, again, uh, this is completely, you know, different cases with loss of domain. And uh, in my mind, uh, I want to get as appropriate of overlap as I can as the as, uh, you know, kind of the saying goes, the giant overlap of the visceral sac. So I truly want to kind of uh, capitalize on that. So to me, this is not a big issue of, uh, you know, actually violating uh, in those particular cases, the posterior rectus sheet, and then as well in all three cases that will present the, uh, at least a portion of transverse abdominal suite because it changes the, uh, the compliance of abdominal wall and helps as well, in addition to both, it helps expand the abdominal wall. In addition, then everything is afterwards is overlapped with mesh. One of the cases actually had a previous midline incision, uh, one of the uh, giant inguinal cases. And in that case, I was certainly very worried that when I reduced things, having to deal with a hernia down the road through the midline that did not have a hernia at the time of the surgery. So again, that was overlapped and in a preventive fashion as well. Uh, so no, not a great concern. Not in those cases. Uh, I think uh, it helps. And uh, I think the giant overlap of this uh, area helps and as well as uh, it increases the compliance. So at least, in, especially in early periods, to help house all the uh, visceral contents back inside the belly. Yeah, but my question, Igor, is would you placate posterior linea alba once you open the rectal sheet or just leave it as it is once there is no hernia? I got you. Okay, so so if they have in those none of those cases really truly had a diastasis to placate. If somebody had diastasis, yes, uh, I would fly. I would placate that before reduction because I would actually worry about further migration and a weakness. So yes, I, I placate diastasis for different reasons. We don't talk enough about 
unstable abdominal walls related to the diastasis sub to grace the cardinal the curative sheet. So yeah, at least at a time. Okay. You got lost most of what you said. Uh, oh, uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, so I said, uh, if somebody had diastasis, I would like it. But in the cases, the three cases presented, the patients did not have diastasis, so I did not have to fly it then. But if they had a uh, grade two or three diastasis, yes, I would fly it before leaving the operating room. Hopefully, you guys heard me.